Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with Rick Smolin. Rick is uh, a well-known uh, photojournalist. He's been working in the field for since since I was wearing short pants. Um, he's also uh, the single most knowledgeable person about publishing photography books in the world, in my opinion. Uh, Rick uh, Rick's pu published. Uh, probably over 100 books. We'll, we'll find out exactly how many, but he's the guy that knows everything that, uh, that there is to know about this. And, you know, as every photographer will, t will tell you, uh, their secret desire or not so secret desire is to publish a photo book and Rick's done hundreds of them. Hi, Rick. Hi, nice to be here. Good to, good to see you. I, I, I just, there's so much, uh, so much knowledge you have that we can share, but first I'd like to, I'd like to talk about the first, uh, the very first day in the life of project. And I think you were, you're, uh, you're in Madison, Wisconsin at a college. I think you were in college when you, when you did your first day in the life of officially. Not quite, not quite, but I looked like it. <laughs> I, I always, I always looked about 10 years younger than everybody else. So very often uh, time and other magazines would send me out because I, I had hair down to my shoulders and I looked like I was 15 years old and people often took pity on me. <laughs> um, and, and no, seriously. So I was often sent to the, the people that were, that didn't like photographers or uh, that other photographers had tried to photograph and it had not done very well because I looked like I was like literally a high school student and that it got me, sometimes it got me where I wanted to go and sometimes it created more problems. But um, I was, uh, I joined a group of photographers, uh, uh, from an agency called Contact, Contact Press Images, which you're a member of still, aren't you? Yeah, I'm still. I mean, I I I I just got in a fight with Bob Pledge this morning, so yeah. Oh, yes, well, that <laughs> makes you official. Yes. <laughs> so I was the baby of the group when Contact was formed. It was uh, you know Doug Kirkland who did the famous picture of Marilyn Monroe wrapped in a sheet. Eddie Adams who did the famous picture in Saigon. John Franco Gorgone, uh, Delete Meta. Uh, Alan Reininger, of course, David Burnett. In fact, David Burnett was the person uh, I was sitting outside the um, uh, at Time Magazine. If you wanted to get work, you would go with your portfolio and you would sit there and, and there was a number of women, mostly women who were picture editors. And so I had a little box of prints. I was still living at college, although I was not in college. And I showed uh, a woman named Alice George, who was a photo editor there, my work. And um, and I came out of her office and David Burnett was sitting there and he said, oh, hi, uh, my name is David. Uh, who are you? And I explained I was you know, kind of still living in college and trying to be a photographer. And he said, can I see your work? I didn't even know who he was. He was just a friendly guy, you know, and, and right, right. So I showed him my work. And he, he said, you know, uh, he said, I really like your work. He said, you know, uh, I, I'm forming a photo agency, um, which it was actually called Pledge at the beginning. We, it was originally called Pledge before it was called Contact after Robert Pledge. And he said, uh, you know, we're looking for a young photographer, younger. Uh, Dave was about five years older than me. Um, but as I said, I looked like I was 16 years old. And he said, you know, we have a lot of assignments that some of our photographers really don't want to do, but we don't want to turn down assignments because we want them to keep coming. So if you wouldn't, if, if you want to join our agency and you don't mind doing, you know, some of the probably less thrilling uh, assignments, um, you know, we'd be happy to have you join us. So I did. So I was there at the very beginning. And, uh, it's a little bit of a long story, but I'll get to the point and answer your question. Um, one of the assignments that came in was to be on the first nonstop flight from Tokyo, from New York City to Tokyo. It was the first time a plane, a Pan Am flight had gone from New York to Tokyo without stopping. And it was one of those really boring assignments where you get on the plane, you fly 18 hours to Tokyo, you take a picture of two guys shaking hands in Tokyo, you get back on the plane and you fly to New York. So nobody wanted to go. And I said, and they said, do you want to do it? And I said, hell yeah, I've never been to Asia. So I left on Monday, told my sister I'd be back on Friday. I was, li was living in her loft in Soho, and I came back 11 months later. I got over there, and the moment I was there, Pledge started getting me assignments. As I go live with the Tokyo police force for a month, uh, Muhammad Ali is coming over to do a, a boxing thing. Uh, the prime minister of Australia is on his way to China. Can you spend a week with him? Um, uh, the um, a typhoon hit Guam and flattened the entire island. So Time Magazine said, can you go? So I was like in heaven. It was for me, it was like, I was like pinching myself. I was renting Learjets. I was meeting prime ministers. I was, it, it was just, it was insane. Uh, in fact, one of the funniest stories was um, 
Burnett actually came over on his own assignment about five months after I was into this. And he said, I can't believe you're still here. You were supposed to have like left on Monday and come back on Thursday. I said, yeah, this is like so cool. And um, so we're, we're staying at a hotel in Tokyo and we get in the elevator and there's Muhammad Ali and Howard Bingham, his personal photographer. And David knew Howard. And Howard said, you know, Bernetti, what are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, um, and so Burnett said, oh, I'm here at Simon. This is Rick. He's with our, us at Contact. And Howard says, what are you guys doing this afternoon? And David said, I don't know. You want to have lunch or something? He goes, well, no. We're, the champ's going to Korea to tour the American bases. We got two extra seats on our plane. Do you want to come with us? So we literally got in the elevator. And three hours later, we're on a plane with Muhammad Ali going to South Korea and touring the bases for a week. It was, that's what life was like back then. It was just it was so surreal. Um, and uh, so anyway, long story short, I lived in Asia, you know, for two or three years. And uh, I'm not a big drinker. But if you want to hang out with Philip Jones Griffiths and JP LaFont and Burnett, all my heroes, all these people were, you know, five to 10 years, I was always the baby. So we're sitting in a bar one night in Bangkok. Philip Jones Griffiths had given me the keys to his room. He had a hotel room at the Trocadero Hotel. And everybody's sitting in the bar and they're all bitching and moaning. It's like all the editor, all these photographers, men and women are going, you know, my goddamn editors and these stupid publications and they chose the wrong pictures again. It's like, it's all, you know, all these sort of cranky old guys, you know? And I said, guys, like we have the coolest job in the world. Someone's paying us $400 a day to, ru to run around and see and meet, you know, people and where the world's eyes and like, wh what would be a cooler job than this? And, and they all sort of said, well, kid, you know, once you've been on here for a while, you'll understand. I said, understand what? And what I realized is I kind of pieced it together through the drunk conversation is that, you know, all of us wanted our pictures to change the world. We didn't want to just be documenting people's lives or situations or calamities or, or horror. We were hoping that when people saw our photographs, that they'd be so moved, touched, affected, disturbed by our pictures that it would actually change the things that we were photographing. And very often that was, most of the time that wasn't happening. Usually an editor back in New York or Tokyo or Paris with the best of intentions would send us out with a clear picture in their mind of what they were looking for. And when we got out there as the photographers, very often they were wrong. You know, there's, they were back in New York and we were actually there in Korea or in Tokyo or wherever. And we'd call and say, you know, I know you asked me to photograph this, but this is actually the story. You got the, you kind of had the story wrong. And they say, you know what, you're just the photographer. Th thanks very much for your input, but we think we got this. And so a lot of us were very frustrated. So anyway, sitting in this bar, it's three in the morning in Bangkok, you know, I sort of said, you know, why don't we all, what, what, if, what if like a hundred of us got together, like from 30 countries, like all of my heroes, all you guys, you know, like my heroes, my peers, some young photographers. And what if we all went to a country, I was living in Australia at the time working for National Geographic. And I said, what if, what if we all descended on a country like for 24 hours, like, you know, on your mark, it said, go the best photographers in the world, like the Olympics of photography. And so all my older, wiser friends said, yeah, kid, you go organize it. Well, I'll come, you know, that figured that'd be the end of that. And I'm a slightly obsessive if you, know, you ask anybody who knows me. So I went out and I spent a year, I met with 35 publishers and they all told me what a stupid idea this was. You know, your friends having a big party in some godforsaken country. I was, I wanted to Australia because that's where I was living. I loved Australia. And they said, you know, who would ever pay $40 for a book of pictures taken by your friends on a day that nothing happens? Like, tell me all the pictures are going to be in your book. And I said, well, I don't know. We haven't shot them yet. You know, no, you have to have kangaroos. You have to have the koala bears. You have to have the opera house. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ, really? I said, then we're just doing the same book but with different pictures. And they said, well, what are you, what's your idea? Just going to let people wander around randomly? And I said, no, we're going to have a team of researchers. We're going to make sure that we distribute the photographers thematically and geographically. Um, we're going to invite the public to take pictures. Um, anyway, I got turned out by everybody. So I went to the Prime Minister of Australia, who I had photographed several times and traveled with. Uh, I know you say, as you do, no, but I, uh, this guy, Malcolm Fraser, was one of the few politicians I met that actually liked photographers. He would ask me for tips of which Nikon lens to buy. It was, it was kind of surreal. He would invite me home for the weekend to take his family you know, Christmas pictures. So I, I went and met with him. And I said, look, I want to bring the best photographers in the world to your country. I love Australia. And it would be like the amazing look at, at like you know, the country that no, the world doesn't know. Would you pay for it? Because I can't get any publishers to put the money up. And he said, yeah, I don't have that kind of money. I can't support a for-profit, you know, thing like this. I said, it's not for profit. Everybody tells me it'll never make any money. It'll never sell. He said, yeah, yeah, I know, but I, I can't. I don't have that kind of budget. 
um, he had actually brought me to Australia. There was a program where they used to bring five photographers a year as a guest of the Australian government to wow. the country. Um, that's how I first got there. Um, so he said, but I'll help you. I, I said, well, you know, don't, don't be polite. If you can't, I, I just need money. And he said, no, no, Rick, here's what I'm going to help you. I'm going to set up meetings for you with the CEO of Qantas, the CEO of Kodak Australia, the CEO of Hertz, of Hyatt Hotels, this guy, Steve Jobs, starting this computer company in America. I said, why would I want to talk to some computer guy? Like, why would I want to talk to business people? I'm trying to do a photo book. And he says, Rick, 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 stick with me here, guy. Listen, you're going to ask Kodak for free film. You're going to ask Qantas for free airline tickets. You're going to ask this guy, Steve Jobs, for free computers. And I said, they're just going to give me all this stuff for free. And he said, yes, because you're going to put their logo on the first page of your book. I said, I can't do that. I'm a journalist. That He said, Rick, 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 this is, this is like a PBS special. You know, the following book is brought to you. Nobody had ever done uh, sponsored books before. So I said, okay. And it didn't occur to me that if the prime minister of Australia was setting up meetings for you, that people would be listening. You know, like it wasn't just like me knocking on somebody's door. Like you're, you're going in under the auspices of the prime minister of Australia. So I, I met with probably 400 companies. I mean, I was obsessive. And six of them said yes. This was not easy. Uh, Steve gave us computers. Uh, Qantas gave us 100 first-class round-trip tickets. Kodak gave us 3,000 rolls of film. Uh, we had no cash at all. Um, I couldn't pay any of my staff. I told all, all the photographers, I can get you here. I can get you a car. I can get you a place to stay. I have no money to pay you a day rate. Everybody said, who cares? Oh, everybody wanted to come. And um, the prime minister said, I want to ask you something in return for helping you make this all possible. And I said, what? He said, I want to be one of the hundred photographers. I said, and I was going to say no, because he wasn't a professional photographer. My friends are going, are you crazy? Like talk about no, no instincts for PR. He said, it doesn't matter if he can take good pictures. He's the goddamn Australian prime minister. So anyway, we did the book. Um, it, we had to self publish it. It became the number one book in Australia. If you could sell 5,000 copies of a $40 book in Australia, that was a bestseller. We sold, um, I think we sold 250,000 copies. You could only buy the book through newspapers. It was not available in any stores. Um, and um, there were all these things where people in the pictures, it, it, it became a, like a nationwide phenomenon. And Ken, I wanted to go back to, to being a photographer. I, I, would, I would have been voted least likely to run anything in college or high school. Totally disorganized ADD. I never finished anything. Terrible grade point average. So I was the least likely person to ever run a company or build anything. So I, d I was so glad when I didn't go to jail for, because I ran up bills, I had no way of paying. If the book had not been a bestseller, I would have ended up in jail because I could not pay any of the bills we ran up. We ended up two years later paying every photographer $1,000. I promised we would take a third of any money we made. I had a partner, Andy Park at the time, and, and then David Cohen, who, you know, David who also uh, joined, and David was fantastic. Um, anyway, um, two years later, we had enough money to pay every photographer $1,000 it's never felt so good to spend a hundred thousand dollars. I felt you know, nobody ever expected to see anything. Anyway, I'll end the story, but um, I thought I'd go back to being a photographer. I love being a photographer. And uh, the governor of Hawaii called us and said, I just saw the book that you guys did on Australia and it's our anniversary, our 25th anniversary of statehood. Would you come and do us? And then um, uh, American Express called and said, uh, we'd love to sponsor a book on Japan because we're fighting with the JCB credit card, it's their biggest credit card. Mm -hmm. so, the, so it just kept going and I, I really never went back to shooting again, which I still miss. I mean, I shoot my kids and I shoot my friends. When, when, when my, friends, my friends get married, um, I tell them hire a wedding photographer, but I wanna come and do a National Geographic wedding on, you know, on my own. I mean, I don't want the responsibility of the grip and grin and all the right, stuff right. you have to do at a wedding, but I just wanna come live with you, you know, and, and with you and your mother. And you, I just wanna do my version of your wedding. So that's sort of what my photography has been, is my, my dad's biggest fear uh, was I was gonna do weddings and baby pictures. And sure enough, here I am now, all these years later doing weddings and baby pictures, but having a lot of fun doing photo books too. That's amazing. I mean, it, 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 it just, it's so typical of the, the people that are successful in this business. You don't take no for an answer. You're humble. You don't really take credit for your success, but you just work like a dog and you knock on every door. It's just, it's, it's, how, I mean, that's the key, right? Also, I mean, you know, I, I, I guess maybe there's so much element of luck. I mean, so many times we've been in a terrible situation with these projects and somebody, like, I swear, I'm not religious, but 
somebody up there has been looking after me because every time things are about to completely tank, somebody or something happens that, that sort of rescues us at the last second. We also have, in addition to doing books, even from the very one, first one, we did a one hour TV special about the making right. of the book. Right. It's a lot of almost all the projects we've done have had some, we went from doing books and then books and movies and then books and movies and apps. Um, and we've also built a lot of technology, like the most recent books that we've done. We did a book, um, came out last year called The Good Fight, America's Ongoing Struggle for Justice. Look, you yeah, have, I have, I do you have that one? I got it around here somewhere. Um, it's one of my favorite books. I learned really so much. It's really a good book, Rick. It's really, it's really nice. It just uh, is showing the power of photography to capture the amazingly inspiring struggles that so many Americans of different genders and races and beliefs have gone through over the last hundred years, you know, towards this idea of justice for all. And also to remind people how much of this progress is now being threatened by Trump and his minions and how they're trying to drag us backwards and destroy a hundred years of, of incredible progress. I don't think any of us ever thought it was possible to see what these monsters are doing right now. And, and the point of the book was to remind people of that. Well, it's a, it's, it brings back the notion to me that photography is always the thing you know, we're, we're on the ground, we're the witnesses, we're the first, uh, we're the first witnesses, and we start the conversation, our work starts the conversation. That's what we do as photographers, we start the conversation. We're not the politicians, we're not the, the statesmen, we're, we just get the conversation started. That's what we have the power to do. Well, th think about this, you know, the picture, Nick Ut's picture of the, the girl in Saigon, uh, sorry, in Vietnam, you know, uh, who had been uh, just burned by napalm, or Eddie Adams' picture, or the man, St uh, Stuart Franklin's picture of the man stopping the tank in Tiananmen Square. There are so many pictures when you write about. When you see a photograph like that, it really changed the, the way that, that the vast majority of people in the world thought about a topic like the Vietnam War or like Tiananmen Square. And um, it's funny because Eddie Adams told me once that standing next to him when he did that famous picture of the street shooting in Saigon was a CBS film crew. So there was video of the exact same event, and yet somehow it's that still photograph of Eddie's that won the Pulitzer Prize that is sort of how imprinted in our brains as the definitive horror of that war. Yeah, there's nothing to compare. All the words that have been written, all the, all the, the newsreel footage, everything. I mean, what compares to that? I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't, yeah. can't think of anything. Um, speak, Eddie, Eddie was, Eddie shot day in the life of Australia and it's amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really a classic Eddie picture that probably <laughs> seen the book. Nobody's seen. And it's literally a, a sheep jumping, <laughs> jumping, you know, I mean, it's just like this beautiful lyrical moment that you don't expect out of an Eddie Adams. Yeah. I mean, he was so versatile. He also, he became very good friends with Clint Eastwood and a lot of other, I mean, he was doing, you know, Movie stuff, you know, you always think of him as the war photographer, but he did portraits. He was incredibly versatile. Uh, it's funny because Eddie was, I'm trying to think of who, you know, if you didn't know Eddie, he was kind of cantankerous and ornery and cynical. But when you actually got to know him, he was very soft and very human underneath. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when you think about it, you know, we always talk about, you know, soldiers coming back from the war with PSTD and we talk about, you know, firefighters and policemen, you know, because of the hard they see every day. And yet you think how many photographers suffer from a form of that, because a lot, I never did war photography, but a lot of the people that I knew that went there, um, you know, they weren't, you know, the, you understand why a soldier would want, need therapy and, and have PSTD, but somehow you never think of the photographers. And yet uh, I know quite a few photographers who, who really saw some of the worst aspects of human behavior and just dealt with it silently themselves. I mean, there's, you know, so many of my friends, um, and in, in a way I credit the day in life books for me not ending up like them as well, because, um, you know, marriages didn't seem to survive very well. A lot of photographers are not very good to their, not, they just weren't there for their present for their kids, whether it was physically or emotionally, just because you, you, you end up putting up a shield after a while because you see so many things that ordinary everyday people don't see. I mean, in a way, our job is to be the world's eyes, but there's a, a price that comes along with that too. Well, there's, 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 a, there's a reason you end up in a, a bar in Bangkok at 3 a.m. and it's not always a great reason. Yeah, yep. But I also feel so honored to be part of that sort of, you know, 
the, the camaraderie. And the thing that always amazed me also as a young photographer is here I am knowing nobody showing up in Bangkok and I'm working for Time Magazine. And a guy from Newsweek says, by the way, make sure the bus is leaving an hour earlier tomorrow than we were told because of the schedule change. And I thought, that's pretty amazing because you would have thought the guy would have hoped I overslept so I wouldn't compete with him. So when you're out there, you know, so shoulder to shoulder shooting, it's every man and woman for themselves. But the rest of the time, this is your family. These are the people that if you get hurt, I mean, Jim knocked away putting his cameras down and dragging another photographer out of the line of fire after he'd been photographed. You hear all these stories of photographers that know, you know, when to put the camera down and when to be a person and when to take the picture. Um, and that's one of the things that's, in fact, when I did the first day in life, but what I loved, it was like inviting all these people who had been so incredibly kind to me as this young kid, knowing nothing, showing up one day. And I was just always amazed at, at that sense of family that I had, I guess, because so many of us were out there alone in the road, we, we sort of became each other's family. No, you can't, you can't stress that enough. And it's a, it's a, there's a brother and sisterhood there. It's, 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 it's all of us together. And like you said, time and time again, the person that's supposedly your main competition is also your best friend and the person you're relying on the most. It's, there's nothing else like maybe, you know, I, I can't think of another profession like it and I miss it. And I, and I long for these people, um, you know, I haven't seen for 20 years. It's, it's, it, there's nothing else like it. And it's kind of like the, the movie cliche where, um, the, the Vietnam veteran comes back and sees this guy who hasn't seen for 20 years and, you know, they have to like pull off a job or do something illegal. <laughs> like, no, we were brothers back then. We're brothers today type of thing. I mean, it's right, true. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I, you know, the day in the life of concept, that was, that was John Lowengard back in the, Hey, yeah, that's life. right. 70, 74, I think, or 75. Day in the Life of America, the special issue of life. I was the last photographer hired for that. That's I was the, that's what I wanted to hear. I want to hear that story yeah. because you were in college at that point, right? Or I was, yeah. Well, again, I was still living at college. I was in seventy. I, I graduated in seventy two, so I was two years out of college. And uh, a friend of mine um, who you know liked my photography came and said, "Did you see Popular Photography this month's issue?" And I said, "Why?" He said, "There's this story saying that life's going to do." A Day in the Life of America. And he said, you know, you should try to go work on that. I said, yeah, like they're going to hire some guy living at college doing like, you know, the college portraits. He says, no, no. He said, really, you should just like, you should go to New York and just try it. What the hell? So he kind of talked me into it. So I got on a bus. I went up to New York City, about a two hour ride and uh, at no appointment or anything. I had no idea how you did this. And I had a box of prints <laughs> in my yearbook. And I got to the Time Life building and I went to the receptionist and I said, uh, I, I found out, I knew the name of the guy was John Lowengard, who was the director of photography, because that had been in a pop photo article. I said, I'm here to see John Lowengard. And she said, do you have an appointment? I goes, I said, no, no, but I'm a photographer and I want to talk to him about this issue he's doing. And she goes, you can't like show up here without an appointment. I mean, and she, she said, you know, um, she basically said, you know, leave. <laughs> I mean, it was like, not like I'll schedule it for you. It's just like, you know, so I, I, I figured, well, okay, I came to New York. I tried, I'll tell my friend I tried. And I was walking out of the building and I was wearing jeans, sneakers, um, and a t-shirt. Very, very fancy for my supposed meeting with the director of photography at Life Magazine. And as I was walking out, I passed the, um, like the service uh, entrance to the building. And there were all these guys my age, you know, early 20s. I was 22 or something, 23. And they were in jeans, sneakers, T-shirts, and they were carrying uh, packages into the building. And I thought, you know what? I walked around the corner to Flax, the like the like the the store, and I they wrapped up. I wrapped up my portfolio in brown paper, and um, I uh, got in line and went in with all of the, uh, the all the messengers. I knew what floor the guy was on, and I got up to the floor and I went to the receptionist on that floor. I'd, I'd taken the paper off my you know, thing and I went to her and I said, um, hi, I'm here to see, I have a package for John Longard. And she goes, okay, leave it here. And I said, well, no, I have to deliver it personally. And she said, you can give me the package. And I said, no, I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to give it to him. And she said, who are you? Who's it from? And I said, well, actually, I'm a photographer and I'm here to uh, talk to him about the special issue. And she said, how did you get up here? And, and then she said, you, you need to leave right now. And she just pointed me back to the elevator. 
So again, I figured, okay, tell my friend, good story. I got it. At least I got on the floor and I went out to the elevator and I pushed the down button. I was thinking, if this was a movie, what would, the, <laughs> what, would the, what would the hero do? And I said, you know what, this, this woman at the front desk, probably she's a receptionist at Life Magazine, but she probably doesn't even see the issue till it comes out. Because to me, the idea of seeing the layouts before life came out would be the most thrilling thing in the world. And I thought, you know, all of her friends probably think she has the coolest job because she works at life and she's like answering the, the phone and sending people like me away. So I thought, you know, I'm going to pull out three prints, my best pictures. I'm going to walk back to her and say, I know you told me to leave, but I just want to show you why I should see John Longard. I want to show you my pictures. And I knew it wasn't going to work, but I just, again, I, I, this is all to tell my friend the story of how I wasn't going to give up. So I went back to her desk and she was on the phone and she was like giving me looks like, what the fuck are you doing back here? You know, it's like... So um, I'm trying not to make eye contact with her because if I look at her, she's going to like point to me and say, go. So I'm standing there and the longer her conversation went on, the more nervous I got. And I realized how like inappropriate this was. And I started shaking. I remember my hands were like shaking, holding these prints. And some guy walks out of one of the offices. And I remember I'm looking down now because I didn't want to look at her eyes because I knew she'd send me away if she made eye contact. And this guy walks next to me. I look down and he's got jeans and sneakers. And I figured, okay, so he's another person like me and this guy says excuse me he said what do you got there kid and like I'm literally my, it's like a fan I'm shaking so much at this point I'm so I'm feeling so stupid and nervous and uh I said on oh, my pictures he said um can I see them and I said sure and I looked up and he was about six foot three his name is Gray Vallette he turned out to be the assistant assistant director of photography at life and um he looked at the picture and said these are really nice pictures he said what are you doing here and I just sort of lost it. I was, I said, you know, I came all the way up here from my college. I just want to show these people my pictures and nobody will even talk to me. He said, okay, just calm down. I said, look, um, I'll go talk to John Longard and see if he'll take a minute to look at your work. He said, do you mind waiting? And I said, oh, okay. All right. And, and this woman, I've now done what she's paid to never allow happen. Right. So I'm still trying not to look at her. And so he says, wait here. So he goes away, he comes back like three minutes later. He goes, okay, John's really busy. And I was expecting to say, so he can't see you. And he said, it might be an hour or two. Like, do you mind waiting that long? It's like, I will just sleep on the couch for the next week until he sees me. I, I, no, I don't mind waiting. So I went and sat there and didn't look at her at all. An hour later, John Lohengard comes out and says, come with me and go back in his office. And we sit down and he says, what do you got? And very, very, you know, sort of no expression on his face at all. And, and oh, I hand him my yearbook and hand him the box of you know Kodak prints and he looks through them. He goes, nice work. He says, what can I do for you? I said, uh, Mr. Longard, I, I read about this day in life of America issue and I, I would love to work on it. It, you know, it just sounds like a, just a cool idea. And he, he said, well, you know what? Um, we're only hiring 99 photographers and we've already hired all 99. So if you want to take some pictures and send them in on the day, I'd be happy to look at them. I remember sitting there thinking, this is the only time in my entire life I will be sitting with the director of photography at Life Magazine. This is like my one shot. So I said, look, I don't mean to be uh, aggressive or anything. I said, just like my whole life, I said, I dream about Life Magazine. Like the day before your issue comes out, I actually, I have dreams about what's going to be in it. I said, my, like, I, I can't even believe I'm sitting in your office. I said, if there's anything I can do to just be part of the actual team, to, to know, to really like, to like to be part of the day in life, a day in life of America, I, I would do anything, any assignment, any, anything anybody wants you want me to do. And he just stared at me and no expression on his face. I just remember this. It seemed like it went on for 10 minutes or probably 30 seconds. He just stared at me. And then I saw the little smile start in the corners of his mouth. And he said, well, I guess it wouldn't financially bankrupt time life if we made it a hundred instead of 99. Okay. You're, you're hired. And I have no memory whatsoever how I left his office, how I got back to college, I, complete blank. And so I got back there and I told my friend what had happened. He said, so what's the assignment? I said, oh, Jesus, I don't know. I, have no, I don't remember anything he said after he said I had. So I called him. I said, Mr. Longard, I'm so sorry. I, I, you must have told me what you wanted me to photograph. He said, I just want you to do like, you know, college life. Just like, what's it like to go to college these days? You're living there. You know, you know everybody there. So um, I, uh, I photographed the kids. I, you know, I, I was so nervous for the three days leading up to it that I, I couldn't sleep. So by the time the day, the day came, I was a nervous wreck. And no, sure. uh, I, photo, I photographed some girls sitting under a tree and it was like nothing was working. And you, you know when you're in flow and you know you're getting good stuff? Right, and right. it was the opposite. It was like, this is all crap. Horrible. 
I got pulled over by a cop. I got a speeding ticket. I took a picture of the cop giving me a speeding ticket. I asked him if I could go to the local jail, and they wouldn't let me photograph any of the prison. It was like a little podunk in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, but they had a, a prison door with a plate of food being put under it. I took a picture of that. Um, and so nothing was working. And I was photographing these girls on the edge of, uh, of the campus. And they said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm working for Life magazine. You know, it was all full of myself. And they said, well, um, you want to come to our house? We're having a party at our house tonight. Why don't you come and photograph the party? I said, okay. So that night I came to, went to the party and I was taking pictures of them, you know, dancing and drinking and stuff. And one of the girls said, we have a tradition in our house here. It's off campus house that when someone's birthday, we take all of our clothes off. And we all take a shower together upstairs. Now I'm 23 years old at this point. These kids are like 19, but I was feeling really old. <laughs> we weren't doing that with like two years earlier. And one of the girls said, well, it's not, it's not your birthday, but because you're working for Life magazine, we've all decided that we should celebrate your assignment by all taking our clothes off. And everybody's pretty stoned at this point, too. Um, so uh, everybody goes upstairs into the shower. And at one point, one of the girls said, you should take a picture of this for Life magazine. I said, yeah, I'm not quite sure that's what Life magazine wants to see. Um, and then I said, are any of you actually like a couple? And, the, and then so two people, uh, Bruce and Debbie, I still remember them. Um, I said, can everybody else get out of the shower? And so I photographed Bruce and Debbie in the shower, soaping each other up. And I had no intention of sending this film to life at all because they're not going to run naked pictures of my friends having an orgy. Um, and so the next morning I was really hung over and I took my film and went to Greyhound. This is how I got my film to New York. I took it to the Greyhound bus station, put in a package and it shipped to New York. Totally forgot that I had left those frames on the roll. So the, John calls me three days later and he goes, congratulations, you have two pictures in the issue. I said, oh my God, that's so cool. I can't believe it. What, what are they? He said, well, the first one is this plate of food at the bottom of this uh, prison door, like incredibly boring picture. And he said, and the other one is the, this picture of this couple taking a shower in the morning on the way to, uh, before they go to classes. It was the morning, right? Because we laid it out as a morning picture. It's, I, I said, um, it was definitely in the morning. Yes, it was definitely in the morning. <laughs> then he said, and you got a model release, right? I said, well, what? He goes, well, you need, we need a model release. These kids are naked and, you know, we need a model release. And I said, okay. So I went back to them thinking, you know, holding my breath, thinking, you know, I, I could imagine, you know, getting my first picture in life and then not getting my first picture in life. So I went, they said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll sign it. So the issue comes out a month later. The first phone call is from my mother. And she said, I love the picture of the food at the bottom of the tray at the, in the prison. She had not gotten to the other picture yet. Um, and the second picture was the Dean of Admissions at Dickinson College saying they were getting furious phone calls from parents all over the country about the naked students showering together before attending classes. In fact, <laughs> um, apparently um, um, applications to go to Dickinson soared the following year despite his um, <laughs> hesitation. Um, but my mother went and bought every copy of Life magazine in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. She had like a stack of a hundred of them. Um, and uh, it was one of the more controversial pictures in the issue. And that sort of launched my, uh, that got me into the time life building and I started meeting the other editors and that's where I met Burnett. So that sort of, you know, came full circle. That's why I was suggesting when we were sitting in the bar, I thought, oh, it was also the worst selling issue of life they ever did. Um, it, they try to put a picture, every photographer is shot, they try to put a picture in and it was this hodgepodge. It was terribly designed. Even me being so grateful to be in there. It was, it was one of the messiest looking issues I think life ever did. So um, I, uh, uh, you know, years later, well, I guess 70, 79, so, so I shot this, I, guess 70, life of I think, Boston, I think. Se, no, 75 was the issue and 79 was when I was sitting in the bar, so it was four years okay. later. That's, what, that's when I said, you know, what if we took that same idea, but instead of, I said to the photographers, you know, um, you're not gonna be guaranteed to be in the book. I mean, it's gotta be the best pictures. So there could be a kid on our staff that's shooting and you won the Pulitzer Prize in your country. And it's gotta be whoever, it, it's gotta be the best pictures and it can't be little tiny pictures. It's gotta be big and bold and, and beautiful. So, um, you know, it was a miracle. I knew nothing about designing books at all. We had, a, we had a designer in Australia who had won the design award of the year and I hired him and the book was awful. And I knew it was awful, but we, he designed the whole book. And then I was on press in Japan and I kept looking at it thinking this book totally sucks. And my sister, Leslie, who's a wonderful designer, I asked her if she'd come over and be on press with me. And she looked at it and said, Rick, um, do you realize how bad this looks? I said, I know. What should we do? And she goes, do you want me to redesign it? I said, well, we're supposed to go to press in like four days. Wow. I said, you, did, you just spent two years of your life on this and the, it looks awful. 
And she said, look, I'm not doing it as an ego. She said, but I can. And so she redesigned the entire book in Japan in two weeks. We were, we were like a month late going to press. Um, and thank God I did it. It was one of those moments where I had to tell the guy, I said, but I had to call the guy and say, I'm really sorry. I know you were like designer of the year, but it just isn't working for me. So there's been things like that over the years where I had to fire people or reject their work or tell a famous photographer. You dodged, you dodged book. I, I never heard that story. I mean, I've never I actually, I, I don't think I've ever told that story. I mean, people know my sister designed the day in life series, but they don't know that there was another design that we literally scrapped on press. Um, is, you don't have to. I mean, I'm not a designer, you know. Right. Um, this is this is not Photoshop. This is not, you know, uh, digital. This is you. You have to make uh, uh, separations in everything at this point, don't you? Yeah. No. It was the it was, we went, we went sixty thousand dollars over on separations. The Japanese thought we were nuts, by the way, because you know. <laughs> who comes to Japan and then in the middle about to go on press, who scraps the entire thing and then, and then redesigns the whole thing on press. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's incredible. That, that, this could have, you, that could have been your last book. No, I mean, that's what I mean. You, you think of those little moments when you look back on your life and you think like, you know, Andy Grove calls them inflection points, but you know, one moment you made a left instead of a right. And because of that, everything that changed. I mean, another example of that is before the day in life books, Time had sent me to do a story about Aborigines in the Outback. And um, I was, the, the story is already written. I was supposed to just go there and photograph uh, Aborigines in their you know, camps out around Alice Springs. And uh, there was a woman I was supposed to meet to take me into the camps. And she said, when you come out of your hotel, make a right and walk two blocks and there's a pub and I'll meet you in the pub. I came out of my hotel, couldn't remember what she said and made a left. And I walked up the street and the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life was washing the windows of my hotel. And I took a picture of her and she started screaming at me to put my fucking camera down. Who the hell do you think you are? And I, I walked over. Years ago, Burnett said, if people get angry at you, usually it's, they think you're making fun of them. So like, don't ever leave, you know, he said, just like rule number one one, if people get angry, always walk, don't ever walk away because then it looks like you've done something wrong. Just always walk over and say, I'm, even if it's a, if a different culture, different language, just say, I'm so sorry. And so I walked over to her and I said, I, I'm so sorry, man. Just the light was so beautiful. You, you were like backlit and, it was just it was just a gorgeous picture. I'm sorry. And she says, Oh, you're American. And in Australia, they usually love Americans. So I said, Yeah. She goes, What do you know? One of these fucking parasites. You probably down here to photograph our Aborigines, right? Like you you guys, you come in here and you take advantage of these poor people and you get your day rates and then you leave and you leave them in misery. It's like you're profiting off their misery. I said, Whoa, I'm really sorry. So look, I am the journalist. I'm not here. She said, Yeah, yeah, you're a journalist. Yeah, would you get out of here? So I left, I'm like, whoa, what was that? met the woman down the street, took me into the camps, took my pictures. At the end of the day, the woman working for me, the, my you know, guide said, you know, what are you doing for dinner tonight? And I, I or what are you doing tonight? I'm going to go back and label my roles of film and do captions. And she said, well, a group of us that work with Aborigines are getting together at a friend's house for dinner. Um, you might want to come and meet some other people involved in the Aboriginal rights movement. And so she gave me this address and I drove to this address she gave me and it was this abandoned looking building. The roof was caved in. It looked like it was abandoned except there were cars parked around. So I walked over and I knocked on the door timidly. And of course, who answers the door but the woman who had been washing the windows of my hotel, who was not pleased to see me. What the hell are you doing here? I said, your friend Jane invited me to a dinner party. She said, well, you can't photograph my friends. Put your cameras down. She says, okay. And I walk in and in the backyard, she's got camels tied up. And I said, what? Why do you have camels? And she said, it's none of your business. So I went to Jane and said, what's like, what is with your friend? Like, I didn't like kill her dog. I just took a picture of her. And she said, oh, Robin's this odd girl that showed up here about a year ago. We worry about her. We bring her food and music. And, and uh, she has this crazy idea. She's going to walk across the outback of Australia with her camels and her dog. And I said, why? And she goes, we don't know. We're afraid she's going to die. We want to go with her. She won't let anybody come. I said, wow, that's, that's nuts. And she said, yeah, we think so too. But, you know, we're kind of protective of her because she's kind of, we love her, but we're, you know, she's a little crazy. And I said, yeah, I, I kind of got that. And so um, at the end of the week, um, Jane said to me, do you remember the girl with the camels? And I said, yeah, a little hard to forget. And she said, well, she wants to ask you a favor. And I'm trying to think, what favor could she possibly one of me after ripping my head off and I thought, did she want to copy my picture? She, wanted to be. she said, well, Robin wrote to National Geographic about six months ago and asked that they would give her money to help fund her trip because she's tired of washing windows and waiting on assholes in pubs. And 
she thought maybe you knew somebody there. She could use your name or something. I said, I've met their editors at, at, at the Missouri workshop that I'd gone to a year earlier. And I said, I don't know if my name would help, but tell her, sure, whatever, thinking that would be the end of it. And then I finally came back to New York. This is my first 11 months in Asia. And a week later, uh, I get a call from a guy named Bob Gilka, who's director of photography at National Geographic. And he said, uh, I just reckon, I said, yeah. And he goes, I don't know if we remembered, we met at the Missouri workshop. I said, of course. He, he said, we got a letter from this woman in Australia describing this amazing journey that she wants to go on and asking us for funding. And, you know, is she, is she nuts? Is she for real? We don't want to, you know, we don't want the headline National Geographic Explorer dies in week two and out back. And he said, so what can you tell us about her? And I said, well, she's very intense. Um, I've seen her camels. Uh, I've seen her maps. Um, I know she's been there for two years, uh, you know, working really hard to get ready for a trip. Um, um, her friends say she's very focused on, I was trying to think of what to say. I barely knew this woman. And he said, well, since you guys are such good friends, would you like to be the photographer that we assign? To, and you'd have to find her five times in the outback. She's going to be traveling about 2000 miles and you're, you're sort of a, a survival guy, right? I mean, you do outback adventures. I wasn't even a boy scout. I mean, I couldn't even change the tires in my car. I said, yes, absolutely. I have no problem surviving in the wilderness. And my friends all said, you know, you're the one that's going to die out there. She's been getting ready for this. Like, you just like, what? You, so this was the beginning of, again, I, you, we were just talking about like one moment. If, if you turn left instead of right, if, you know, I just can't imagine um, my whole life changed because of that. She was the most interesting person I'd ever met at, the, at that point in my life. And just fascinating and um, thought, for, I mean, I fell in love with her. She hated me for the first half of the trip. Um, she almost died many times during the trip. Um, and I grew up a lot. I went, you know, every girlfriend I'd had up to that point lasted about a week. And then I get an assignment, like, we'll work this out when I come back. And I, I would never come back. And Robin, you know, because I had, a, I kept coming back and I spent a lot of time with her and I was terrified she was going to die out there. Um, it was sort of my year of, you know, becoming, you know, uh, uh, more of a human being than I was before. I was certainly uh, immature. Uh, I still am, but, um, you know, I was, it, she it was just it was fascinating and now they've just made a movie about this which is really surreal as well with actors playing so, us so along along with uh i mean your first national geographic cover it was also a, a growing experience as not just a photographer but just as a human being it's 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 shaped who you are today oh absolutely i mean i would show up out there with her and i'd be blathering on about I was just shooting you know because when I would leave her I'd go off and shoot for other magazines so at one point I showed up and I'd been shooting a cover story for Time magazine on Taiwan and so I, I managed to find her the Aborigines always knew where she was even though she would say I it never took me more than a day to find her ever even though wow. she hadn't seen anybody for weeks the Aborigines always knew where she was and so I sit down next to the campfire and I'm saying I'm so you know hope my film came out I wonder if it's gonna be the cover and I hope it does, the film doesn't get x-rayed on the way back to New York and She's sitting on one side of the campfire and I'm sitting on the other. And she looks at me and she goes, when are you going to get here? I said, excuse me? She says, when are you going to get here? I said, you mean next time? She goes, now, no, now. I said, um, and I, you know, I always thought she was a little crazy. I thought, uh, I'm here now. I'm sitting here by the fire and you're sitting over there. I thought, you know, wow, she's been here for two months. I hadn't seen anybody. Maybe she's like flipped out. She goes, no, she says, you know, you tell me how much you want to spend time with me out here. And then you show up and all you do is talk about where you leave the car in two weeks when you leave me where you just came from, did your film get x-rayed? It's like, if you're gonna be here, how about like being here and don't be lost in your fucking head the whole time because it's really annoying to have you show up and all you do is talk about where you were or where you're gonna be, you're never ever present. It's like, whoa, okay. Um, you, and she was right. I mean, I'm always planning ahead or thinking, I wish I'd done that. And then um, once I showed up and she said, you know, you Americans treat friendship like Valium. I said, this is like the insult of the day. She was always like poking me. And I said, what is that supposed to mean? She said, well, every time I see Americans together, you're always saying, don't worry, it's fine. It'll all work out. I said, that's a bad thing. And she goes, yeah, because in Australia, if you care about someone and, you're, and they're, they're taking drugs or they're marrying the wrong asshole, or it's like you hit them over the head with a two before you risk your friendship to be a friend. You're also cowardly that you, your friendship, you want it. It's like, you're all coddling each other all the time. It's like every time I give you feedback, you get hurt. It's like, that's what friends do. I mean, friends are honest with each other and say, you don't have to agree with me. But if I tell you that's a stupid thing, then you you say, no, it's not. It's like, I listen to you people and it's like, okay. I said to her, first of all, I can't 
um, I'm not representing all Americans, but that's an, I mean, every conversation with her was like that. This is like somebody who was the same age as me, slightly younger, but it was like one of these people is very worldly. I mean, she had so many interesting ideas about relationships and about what we're doing on earth and the difference between, she said, do you make appointments to see your friends in America? I said, what do you mean? She goes, like, do you just, do you knock on the door and come over and say, here I am, or do you call them first and make an appointment? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, you call. She goes, in Australia, if you just show up. It's like, it isn't like a business thing. It's like, it, you, every American I meet says, what do you do for a living? Who cares what you do for a living? That's not who you are. And, and anyway, it was, I'm going off here, but I mean, it, it, I learned a lot during that year about myself, not as, not as a photographer, but as a person. And it was the first time I'd gotten that kind of brutally honest feedback. And I, I, I hope I'm a better person because of it, you know? So that was another tangent. <laughs> and then there's um, a, and I also, I also, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say that because I was so lucky to have gotten hired, you know, be, to meet David Burnett and Robert Pledge and to get hired by time and to work for the Geographic, by the time I was 29, I had done a lot of the things that I thought I'd be lucky to do by the time I was 50. And so I would watch people like Eddie Adams and a lot of my other friends who were in their 50s or older and think, do I want to be doing this 20 years from now? Do I still want to be waiting for someone else to wind me up and send me out on assignments? And so when the idea of the First Day in Life book came out, I, I wasn't jaded and I wasn't full of myself. I just thought if I, I've now shot eight covers of Time, the cover of National Geographic and a, the cover of the New York Times and a million other magazines. And I thought, if I have another hundred covers, am I going to be happier or better? I'm not sure. Like it, after a while, I felt like been there, done that. And I didn't know that doing 20 covers instead of eight was going to make me feel that much better or, or accomplished. So I started thinking what I really want to do is find things that I can affect with my photography. And so, you know, the, the day in the life books were photographers are much better than me. I thought if I can actually kind of bring together the, the, the gathering of the tribe once a year and, and do books that we as a group of photographers felt proud of, and that would maybe push the envelope a little bit in terms of what the public's understanding of what a good photograph is. It's not just a plane crash or a war, but it's actually, a, it's like um, extraordinary pictures of everyday life. It's so much harder. I always thought, if I was a photo editor and I wanted to see if you are a great photographer, I would send you to a shopping mall. Because if you can make interesting pictures in a shopping mall, you're a good photographer. I mean, anybody can take interesting pictures in a war zone or a crash or a typhoon. It doesn't, you know, it's not that hard because it's inherently dramatic. But if you can take mundane things and make it interesting, that is really talented, I think. So, so I, I always quote you on that. I don't know if you coined the phrase, but that idea of making extraordinary pictures of the ordinary, I think that's actually your, your quote. I mean, is that you? Is that Lowengard? Who, who came up with that? I think, um, I think it was Amy Schiffman from American right. Photo. Someone wrote a story in the right, early Right, 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 right. Someone, someone wrote a story on the, about the first book, and I think that's yeah. how it was described. It might have been Sean Callahan. I, I think it was Amy Schiffman, though, who wrote the article for American Photo. Um, I, I love that. Was, that was that was American Photographer magazine. We got to separate that from American Photo. That American Photographer was really a good, insightful magazine that really dug into to issues like this. They had great writers. Yeah, well, Sean Callahan started it. Yeah, right. And, uh, there, there, there was a whole series of books which I love called the Contemporary Masters of Photography. And they were, um, Elliot Irwin, who's my father-in-law, was one of the people who's focused, Doug Kirkland, um, uh, uh, Mary Ellen Mark, and Annie Leibovitz. And it was about their professional lives, their personal lives, their technique. And like the book, it was, it was sort of paperback books. Larry Schiller was the publisher of them, if you know who he is. Um, but they were really interesting. It gave you insight into the human beings behind the photographs, which I think in that context, I think always makes it interesting. And then that series of books, the contemporary masters of photography, which if your listeners or viewers are, are, are curious, you can find them for like one penny on, uh, you know, on, on uh, eBay or a Libris or Amazon. They're really worth getting. They're so, they're just as interesting today as the when they were published, but that led to the American photography uh, magazine, which is very much like an ongoing version of that. Also done by Sean. Right. Right. So tell me, you you put you brought editors over um, to the I mean the day in life Australia 
but you always worked with editors really closely. Tell me about some of the editors on that first project and how those relations, I mean, you had relationships with how they grow from that. Well, sure. I mean, uh, we had, uh, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Rand, who is a very famous editor of London Sunday times, Terry Leguman, who ran a photo agency. Um, uh, gosh, well, there were so many people on that first, um, the first book that we did. Um, I mean, imagine was Pledge there I, in Sydney? No, I, I wanted him to come, but he he didn't come for that. Um, um, Karen? Uh, Karen Rocky wasn't on the first book. I think she was on the uh, the, the Day in Life of America. Um, um, Woody Camp came. I don't oh. know if you knew Woody Camp. Yeah, Woody. Woody was wonderful. And uh, Steve, um, I'm sorry, my brain... This is no coffee today. I didn't yet. mean to, didn't mean to put you on the spot. Ago. I was no, just no, curious. Fine, but, no, I mean, the, the editors are incredibly important. To, but one of the things that also was really, you know, we were talking about, you know, if you turn left instead of right, every editor would edit one photographer's work. And, and, and then nobody else would ever go back through those boxes. And then they would project at night, slide carousel trays of their edit. And I always thought, boy, if we had a different group of editors, if you put all the slides back into the boxes, and you you know, and you had a different group of editors go through them, the books probably would have been totally different. I mean, I remember, I remember once, once there was a photo editor that went through Delete Meta's work and projected it. And I said to my wife, Jennifer Irwitt, um, who became one of my, my partner on these projects, um, I know there's gotta be better stuff that Delete Meta is such an extraordinary photographer. And that, what that editor showed us does not at all represent his work. And so we went back and had someone else edit it and the editor had missed so many pictures that ended up in the book. And it was just like, oh my God, like how many times this has happened where we didn't, you know, we didn't have the resources to have every photographer edited twice. But again, you know, if you, if you were at the end of a four day edit and those editors are really tired or just wrong editor with the wrong photographer, I mean, it's scary when you think the randomness of all this. And of course that's true in every magazine and every assignment, right? If you get this editor instead of that editor, um, the pictures that end up in the magazine can be very different because this is the other thing that the public doesn't realize is that very often you as a photographer go on to your next assignment and you know, you're, you have a clear idea of what you think would be the good pictures if you were sitting there. But I would spend 11 months away not seeing any of the things I shot. I would just send the film back undeveloped to New York, hope it didn't get x-rayed the way back, hope that the chemicals were fresh the day they developed it, hope that the film stock itself was okay to begin with, hope I didn't have dust in my camera that, that scratched every picture. Um, Burnett taught me years ago, again, I, I refer to David all the time because he was really my mentor, but we would go out to um, Narita Airport and look for stewardesses, flight attendants, and, and say, here's a barf bag full of film. I work for Time Magazine. Could you carry this to New York? And Richie, the cab driver, will pick you up and give you a free ride to New York. And we're giving them a sealed package, a barf bag, right? Anything could have been in those rolls of film. It could have been drugs. It, I mean, it bombs. It could have been anything. And it just amazes me. You think of this is the 70s, right? And the 80s, I guess. But you just think of what a different era that was, that the people were so trusting um, and uh, that you could just walk up to a stranger and trust they wouldn't lose your film and that they would trust you that you weren't giving them something that would get them in trouble. And they were doing this for a free ride to New York City from JFK. Just bizarre. No, you bring up a, a name from the, Richie just passed away not too long ago, but he was the contact press images driver. Um, Cab driver, I know, <laughs> yeah. No, and like, insane, and eventually he got insane. a black car. Oh yeah, that's right, I yeah. remember. But so, I, I, think, I think either Pledge or Burnett, just, he was such a character. He was like, he was, like, uh, he was out of that TV was, show, Taxi. He was, he like was out of central Taxi. casting, Richie. Right, yeah. <laughs> And you know he yeah, could. I mean, there's really, there's really a sitcom here. Well, that's <laughs> a sitcom or Mad Men. Well, <laughs> it is Mad Men. I mean, I mean, the I I I talked to Burnett a couple of weeks ago, and we did two back to back episodes, and I couldn't get him to give that word picture of the office on Central Park West. Can you just give? give people an idea what that place looked like, what it was felt like to be uh, in, now it's Robert De Niro's apartment, but back then it was contact press <laughs> images. 
So um, it was an amazing apartment on, I think, the 11th floor overlooking Central Park with just drop dead views out the window. Um, filing cabinets everywhere, stuffed with photographs and slides. Um, one of the things I remember the most distinctly was Choo Choo the cat, which was uh, Robert's uh, cat, would sleep on top of um, Tupperware boxes with any Leibovitz's negatives in them. And the, ne and the sun would be pouring in, baking the negatives. And of course, the cat was sleeping there because it was warm, which is what my cats do. And I kept saying, guys, you know, someday these pictures actually might be like historically important. And I said, you know, stock photographs someday could like, you know, be our like retirement. And everybody, Eddie Adams and, and all these people looked, said, kid, like all they, all they wanted was next week's assignment. It was always what the next thing was. And last week's assignment, that was old news. And it's like, I remember Eddie used to get really annoyed with me because I kept saying, we need to think about these as history. And he kept saying, you're so pretentious. It's like, we're journalists. We're not artists. Like, what is this crap about artistic? For, for the you know? record, for the record, the Associated Press lost Eddie's original negative of the execution, street execution. Just for the record. Yeah, I know. But I just, you know, all the pictures, I mean, Annie had just spent like a year living with the Rolling Stones on, on you know, on their plane. She had all these amazing pictures. Um, I'll tell you one other funny story about, and this is not related, but it, it's vaguely related to your story about uh, contact. But anyway, the office was, you know, it was always, it was, there was light boxes everywhere. And um, um, uh, I'm trying, I'm just drawing a blank. Um, anyway, um, on Monday morning, Time and Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report and the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times would all, all they would fax us. And even faxes were brand new then. Um, they would often messenger over lists of all the pictures they thought they needed for that week's issue. And so we had a whole team of people of contact who would go through all the slides um, all of, uh, and, and prints and put together a package that a bicycle messenger would then bicycle messenger across New York. And by the time the pictures got there on Tuesday, um, half of those pictures weren't needed anymore because the stories had changed. And then on Friday, when they closed the issue, the bicycle messengers would then bring the slides back to contact and the prints. And some intern would put the pictures labeled Austria in the Australian um, um, slides, and nobody would ever see them again because they had been misfiled. Uh, we would make dupes of our slides, which were like, you know, third generation dupes that looked like shit. Um, it was just utter chaos. I mean, there was just people coming and going and messengers, things getting lost. I mean, the whole idea now of digital originals, right? Where you can scan a picture and then the copy is as good, it may be even better because you now put it in Photoshop and you sharpened it and dodged and burned it. Um, every copy you made was one generation worse. And so the quality of the pictures that were being sent out was also, you know, abysmal in some cases. And you'd want to send your original because you're afraid the messenger guy would, you know, get drunk and lose them. So um, it, it, again, all of it seems so primitive now compared to how we do this. Um, but I want to side about Annie for a second, which is two things. Um, Annie was part of our agency. Um, and I think Robert is one of the few people that Annie trusted. Um, and she'd come back from an assignment and decided she didn't want to wait at the baggage carousel for her equipment. And she would just abandon it. And then she'd go buy it again the following week. And this happened over and over and over again. She was like, you know, totally sheer brilliant on one side of her brain and completely lost on the other side of her brain. And uh, one day I was in Australia and uh, one of my biggest heroes in college, one of my, the music musician I, I adored the most was Jackson Brown. Not only for his music, for his political stance and just the music really spoke to me in a way that I had very few musicians. You know, I felt like it was the guy, I, you know, I felt very connected to him through his music. So um, one day I was in Australia in between assignments with Robin and um, a friend of mine called and said she was handling the PR for his campaign, for his uh, tour of Australia. And she said, I know you love his music. Would you like a press pass? I said, oh my God, I would love that. It would be fantastic. Thank you. She said, meet me at the Hyatt Hotel in King's Cross at 5.30. I'll meet you there. I'll bring you your press pass. And, and then, um, you know, we'll go to the concert together. So I got there at 5.15 to be early. 5.30 comes, 5.45, 6 o'clock, 6.15. The concert's starting at 7.00. And 6.15, I figured, well, okay, she's not coming. And I start to get up, and somebody taps me on the shoulder. And I turn around, and it's Jackson Brown. He goes, are you the guy from uh, National Geographic? And I said, yeah. He goes, um, your friend is late. She's stuck in traffic. Um, we didn't have cell phones back then, so I guess she pulled over and called the hotel. Uh, he said, why don't you just hop in my limo and come with me? 
Nice. We get in the back of this limo. It's like, I am sitting there going, I, I'm pinching myself. I'm in the back of a limo with Jackson Brown and I'm trying to breathe normally. You know, you're trying to act cool, right? When you're like, holy shit, I'm so freaked out. Um, and he said, you're American? I said, yeah. He goes, what are, you, what are you doing here? And I told him about the story I was shooting with Robin. And he said, do you know Eddie Leibovitz? I said, of course. I said, I, I'm in a photo agency with her. He said, I am so in awe of her. He said, she, she was just on the road with us, the, the uh, Traveling on Empty tour. He said, like, we were so lucky that she was in our bus. And so here I am admiring Jackson Brown as my, like, God. And here he is talking about Annie. It's like, we were so lucky that she actually spent, like, two months on our bus. So he, I, I mean, I've never heard of, I mean, Annie is, is you know, the, all the people in the music industry saw Annie the way that I see the people in the music industry. Like, like the best that there is, right? They all felt like they were so lucky that she would spend time with them. I actually, um, he invited me to hang out with him the next day at his um, hotel. He had his, uh, his four-year-old son with, with, was with him. And he had met a girl the night before in Brisbane that he ended up marrying. <laughs> Again, one of the, you know, somebody he met at the concert. And so um, he said, what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, uh, I, I don't, um, I don't know. He said, well, come hang, come to our hotel and hang out. So I got in the pool with my camera and I took this picture of him and his son, then Ethan, uh, at four, and uh, two years ago, Rolling Stone called me and said, uh, we're doing a book about um, musicians of the 70s, and we've asked each of them to p pick one picture they want to represent them, and Jackson wants to know, uh, he wants the picture that you shot of his son, Ethan. Nice. So that's a double page spread in this new issue they just did. So again, these weird threads, right? Um, anyway, I, I, I've seen him a couple of times since then. He always talks about, he's always you know, one of those, he, I'm not surprised now meeting him that who he is because his music always felt like a real human being. Sure. Some of these guys fall in love with themselves and he never did. Yeah. Nice. Well, so, I mean, speaking of hero worship, the, uh, the, uh, the, the offices of contact press images, if you stuck, ar stuck around there for a week, you'd, there's no telling who you'd meet. And it wasn't necessarily contact press images, photographers, although that, that stable was pretty, pretty well st stacked. Um, you know, Eddie could come by even, you know, if he wasn't with the agency for some weird reason, probably looking for a check, you know, anybody could walk in through those doors and did. It was, uh, it was like photography central. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was. I mean, also Robert was always the sort of the Eminence Greece, whatever the word is, like, you know, people, whether or not they were part of contact, Robert was always, you know, um, sort of putting people together and organizing exhibits and talking to the Chinese and finding new ways of packaging things. And, and uh, you know, he was, he was sort of like, was it Steichen, right? The way that Steichen sort of molded photographers and gave them feedback and helped guide their careers. So throughout his whole career, Robert loves photography and loves photographers. And I think they feel that back. Um, really no, it was a, it was a salon a salon environment and um, it was a, it was the seventies early eighties you know early eighties when I people were smoking there were there were slide boxes you know the plastic boxes used as ashtrays yeah. on the light table <laughs> <laughs> and you know the, the the people that actually worked at contact you know Barbara or, or whoever they'd be frustrated with Bob because it was always if you it, it was he could always get distracted by another project and there there he would be he would go and uh, it was it was a fascinating yeah, I mean, time Robert, Robert is like the, the original ADD but in a good way right I mean he was all he was immediately distracted I mean that was the that was I think as a photographer sometimes the frustration was that if Robert was it's sort of like if Robert was on for your story he would get you had published it in 100 places but if you he was but if he wasn't if when he got tired of it it would just sit there in the boxes and, right. and it was sort of you know there wasn't as much organizational structure i think mean, david cohen was the first person that came into contact that didn't get eaten alive by the photographers that stood up and fought photographers i mean david i think david made a really big difference for the years he was a contact you know he he was the the, the problem solver right and he you he know i think one of the problems that, yeah right but he also knew how to say no and and not be in awe of the photographers and you know he was like the perfect partner to them instead of trying to be there you know compete with i don't know i mean it's sort of i think one of the problems that magnums always had is they put photographers in charge of the agency which is insane 
I mean, it's a completely different skill set. Right? It's amazing Magnum's still alive. Right. It's amazing any photo agency is still alive at this point. You know, what's happened in the, I mean, I don't think any of us realized we were in the heyday of it either. It just, you know, I think it just felt like how, how could this, start, it's just going to keep going. The idea that the magazines would start dying, that, that you know, day rates would be stagnant or, or that people, I mean, even, you know, five years ago, people were still paying, you know, a couple hundred dollars for a stock photograph. And now, you know, with, with iStock Photo, they're paying a dollar. And now everybody's, everybody's got a phone in their pocket. People are happy to get their pictures published for free just to have their name underneath it. It's, it's really tough out there right now for most of my friends. Um, so, um, no, it's, it's, it's terrible. And when we talk about, you know, you, it's funny, I'm sure the, you know, Philip Jones Griffith, people like that were saying, Oh, you just missed it. You just missed the golden age kid. And <laughs> yeah. When I got to contact, you know, people like Alon Reiniger would tell me the same thing. Ah, you just missed it. You just missed it, kid. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, 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 I know. I know. So uh, what's uh, what? What are you working on now? What's uh, how many how many actual books have you published? Just for the the record. Um, well, um, David Cohen and I um, went our separate ways for various reasons. Uh, David was my best friend for many years, and then um, it's a long story, but you know our friendship fell fell apart. Um, and then we we got back together again and did a, a series of books called America 24-7. We did a nationwide book. It was the first year that digital cameras were out selling film cameras. And we thought it was uh, several years after 9-11. And we thought that the way that America's story was being told to the world by George Bush and by the government was not the way that most Americans wanted our story told. And we thought, what if we did a book where we would send a thousand photographers out just to be even more insane? Uh, so we sent 20 photographers to every state and then we also opened it up to the public for the first time. So it was like crowdsourced as well. And, um, and so we actually did one massive book. Um, and then we did uh, one book for every state a year later. So that was 51 books in two years, which, which was totally horrible. I mean, the, the, the national book I liked a lot. Um, and, uh, there's a young kid in our staff named Josh Hainer who, um, started interning for us when he was 16, and he came up to me with a box of prints the way that I got up to John Longar with a box of prints. And his mother called me and said, is there any way that, you could, that Josh could like intern for you over the summer? And he worked for us for a couple of summers. Then he went to Stanford to graduate top of his class. Then he came back and worked for us on the day in life of um, on America 24 seven. And one day my daughter was about three years old at the time. And he said, do you have a picture of your daughter? This is why we're still designing the book. And I said, yeah, why? He said, just, just give me a picture of your daughter. The next day he walked in and he had a replacement dust jacket that wrapped around the book, but there on the cover of the book, instead of the picture that we had chosen for the bookstore version of the book was my daughter, but it had America 24 seven. It had all the boards from the New York times and all the dust jacket copy. And he said, I've written the software, found the vendors, and we can allow people to upload pictures of their dogs, their cats, their weddings, their children. And when they get a copy of our book, they will be on the cover. And then Oprah Winfrey heard about that. And she put it on her favorite things show. 80,000 people tried ordering a book with themselves on the cover within 24 hours of her show, which all of our servers melted down. It was insane. We ended up selling 1.4 million copies of that, uh, that book and that series. Um, so that was sort of the rebirth of it. So probably, I've probably done about 80 books over the, usually it's one, one every 18 months, more or less. And again, it's not just a book. It's a book. It's a TV show. It's an app. Um, it's all kinds of interactive stuff that we've done over the years. Um, I, I kind of figure it sounds a little gimmicky, but I feel like, um, when people ask me, like if I want to, people say, how can you give me some tips about how to, how to do a photo book? So the tips I, I give, and they may work or may not, but first of all, I say, you know, see if there are corporations or companies or organizations that are related to the topic of your book and go to them and try to get them to help you in some way, whether it's money or resources or whatever, you know, whatever, the, the, and put their logo in the book or, or, or get them, you know, ask them for um, uh, airline tickets or film or, or hotel rooms or whatever it is, and then give them 500 copies of that book with a special page at the beginning saying we at, you know, first bank of Wisconsin are so proud to be the official bank of this book. Cause then you get, you get your print run up and you have all these people that have the same pride in the book that you do as the creator. And then you have all these people out there talking about your book. 
And then the second thing is I always try to come up with some kind of cool technological hook. So the last three books we've done, and especially the Good Fight book, America's Ongoing Struggle for Justice, um, there were 60 pictures in the book. And if you point your phone at those pictures, it launches TED Talks, YouTube videos, documentaries um, that expand the viewer's understanding of that particular story. And it's a gimmick, but it's actually pretty cool. Um, and it got us a tremendous amount of attention uh, for the book. And again, it, it sets you out from every other book in the marketplace because there's some, like Mac, Mac World would have no reason right, to right. write about America 24, about, uh, you know, um, the good fight. But now all of a sudden there's an app involved. So now we have all these technical publications writing about it. And now I, so I guess, I guess those, you know, you can go to, um, I, I just find um, that publishers now are the last place to go to publish a book. It sounds totally stupid, but um, there's a lot of publishers that want the photographer to pay them for the privilege of having the book published. And then they want to sell you copies of your own book at a profit, which I think is just so offensive. And yet that's a model that was started a couple of years ago. And now that a lot of publishing companies, because photographers so much want to get their work published, um, they've inverted, instead of paying you a royalty, you're supposed to pay them for the privilege of, of having your book published. So it's like a weird form of vanity press. Even Aperture is doing it now, which is, I mean, like I understand it's really hard to sell photo books out there right now. But I, I just, I think the part that offends me the most is when they want the, they want, a, they want the photographer to pay um, the publishing company a profit on their own books. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing if the photographers, you have to, I mean, I think some of these publishers want $18,000 and they want to do a Kickstarter campaign that they keep so they keep the money they they want you to pay them, and then they want you to buy books, copies of your own book. Um, and they want they want you to hire a designer and do the layout and everything else. Yeah, they want you to do everything. So what are they doing? <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, you could publish your own books and get a distributor. I mean, I'm, I tried that once or twice, and it wasn't very pleasant. But um, it's just it's really hard out there right now, and um, it's also so much work just to publish, you know, for two or three thousand copies of a book. You know, as I said, we got spoiled. You know, David and I and Jennifer, when we were doing these books, we would sell half a million copies. Now we can sell 20,000. It's a miracle. But you did something. I mean, I, you, I, you did something very smart, you and David, from, I don't know, probably by the time you got your third or fourth day in the life of book under your, under your belt. You, uh, you signed a contract that, that paid you for every book printed, I'm pretty sure. Not every book that was sold. It's the difference between gross and net. And that's, to me, I always, I, I always no, followed that. Right. No, no uh, I don't, well, um, I'm trying, I'm, there's been so many different variations on all the different deals we've had with, with companies. Um, we got an advance, right? right? So that a publisher would give us pretty sizable advances. So basically in effect, you're right. When, in effect, we were getting paid for the first, hundred thousand books whether or not they sold and then we would have a tiered royalty structure so if it sold over a quarter of a million copies the royalty would go from 10 percent to 12 percent you know to 15 percent not i don't know if it ever got to 15 percent but um and there's a couple of other things that we always did one is we always i never wanted to see my books on a remainder shelf at barnes and noble for 50 cents it just it was too heartbreaking these you know before right. i had kids these books were like felt like my kids like you know was that before billy was born or was that before the japan book that's that's we always used to use that as a way of lodging things in time so we always had something in our contract with all of our publishers saying that at a time that you decide the book is no longer selling in the marketplace you have to offer us the rights to buy the books at the lowest remainder price so i'd rather buy you know ten thousand books at 50 cents each and then find a way to sell those books separately which i always always then and having them just dumped in the bookstores i just figured it just dilutes the brand and even worse than that it just it just hurts me too much to see the books you know sort of you know just that's, with so, the that's, you know. that's so smart so you get you get to you get to you know find a home for those books and um which isn't easy but you get to you know uh marketing wise it's just so smart I'm just... now it's like yeah and and so yeah well, I mean, the the the, le the first the first lesson I want to take away from this is always live your life as if you are in a movie, and that's kind of what you've done. That's, what you've done. <laughs> <laughs> that's been my secret motto. I, I you know I don't know if I'm a sidekick or the protagonist. I don't know. <laughs> um, 
The second thing, you know, I, this is probably a contact press image thing because uh, Frank, Frank Fournier, Fournier always used to tell me, you know, I used to go, Frank, I'm working so hard. He's like, Ken, you need to work as hard as you possibly can, but then you need to work as smart as you possibly can. And that's something else yeah. that you've done. And I, I don't know, is that a contact press image thing? Is that one of our uh, founding uh, mottos? I don't know. But you've done that. It seems like every, it seems like everybody at contact does have that work ethos, you know, where you, you, you sort of come at it from every possible angle. You don't just do it and you're done. It's like, I mean, Burnett, you know, again, I refer to David all the time, but I feel like Burnett is one of those people who just came coming, you know, when he did the, the, the longest ride, you know, the last sort of open ride of horses across America. There's so many stories he did. Uh, the things he's doing now with, with elder sports. I mean, you know, if I was a photo editor and I was trying to judge whether or not I wanted to hire a photographer, what I would want someone to show me is how they took something they're passionate about and they came at it from all these different angles. So I think if this person works that hard for themselves, imagine what they're going to do for me. Uh, somebody just sits around and waits and says, oh, I haven't had any work lately, so I haven't been shooting. It's like, that's bullshit. I mean, if you're really a photographer, you shoot for yourself. And the assignment is the is like the extra. I remember, again, reading about Elliot Erwitt way before I had ever met him or married his daughter, that you know he would carry a Leica with him. And so no matter where anybody sent, he would, no matter what the assignment was, he would take it. I don't think he ever turned down an assignment ever because he just figured, you know what? it's a way to get someplace in the world that wouldn't have been otherwise. And I don't really care if the assignment's interesting or not. First of all, he always made it interesting. He always did amazing stuff. But then, you know, he would always shoot at the same time. He does separate camera at the time, which he would shoot all of his personal pictures on, which I just loved. I thought, what a great idea that he's always shooting for himself. And the assignments are merely the, the you know, it was the pound of flesh to get him there. And, right. and again, you know, it, so you can turn left and right instead of sitting around waiting for someone to tell you what you should care about to photograph um, so we could spend we could spend another hour just talking about Burnett but uh, so ironically the when we first met was at the 88 South Korean Olympics and the last Olympics I did was in Beijing in 2008 and Burnett was there and Burnett's uh, <laughs> I, I walked in I, I left the 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 the, the photo workroom probably about two in the morning. I went back to my hotel, slept for a few hours, came back at about six in the morning and Burnett was still there. And I said, David, where'd you sleep tonight? And he pointed to underneath the table where his computer was. <laughs> this is what we're talking about. Not only brilliance on a, a the, just the creative brilliance, but the, but the sweat equity to make it happen. I think David is one of the most underrated photographers in the world. I mean, I, I say that because everybody that knows him, admires him, and loves his work. And I always have felt that David, David should have a, like an exhibit at the, in the Museum of Modern Art. It, I think one of, the, one of the things is because he is so multi-talented and does so many different things so well, he doesn't fall into one slot. And so people are, have trouble saying, oh, he's the fashion photographer. He's the war photographer. He's the you know, the, the photographer of, of uh, you know, elder athletes. He does everything so well that somehow people can't pigeonhole him and therefore they don't know quite what to make of his work. Um, and he's, he's such a wonderful storyteller too. I love what he's been doing on Instagram, you know, his, right. his, uh, his, the, and, and Facebook. The stories that he posts are so beautifully written and so eloquent. Um, he's got so many, so many of them. Um, he's also technically amazing. I love that, that, uh, you know, the narrow focus that looks like you think you're looking at little miniature, you know, creature, little like dioramas, and then you realize oh, these are real people. Right. Um, and again, that dedication of like, I'm just going to throw myself into that. It's like somebody decides I'm going to shoot everything at a quarter of a second for the next year just to see what happens and then turns that into a whole new art form. Just unbelievable. Now, what, uh, what people don't, you know, we, I want to be talking about you, but we get, we're getting sidetracked, and that's okay. But what, what David does with something, if you if you looked at how he works, uh, especially when he's shooting in thirty five millimeter color film, he's doing things that technically aren't possible. Just they're not possible <laughs> to do the math. Yeah, um, no, I mean, technically, that's the interesting thing is that some people are super technical, but they're not that creative. He's able to 
have equal measures of extraordinary technical ability with the sense of spontaneity and playfulness in the pictures. You don't see that almost ever, those two things together. Right. So you, uh, you know, uh, he's one of a kind, he's our hero. So, and he was your mentor and mine. So, <laughs> um, you mentioned, you know, I never, I never knew, uh, Gray Villette and you mentioned him in a very, just the most kindest way today. And I'm, I'm talking to his uh, widow, Barbara, in about two days. And so can you just yeah. uh, oh, tell me a little great. bit more about Gray? If people don't know, Gray was one of the most, uh, I, he just, he, he was forgotten. Um, and Steve Crowley, a, a friend of ours, uh, kind of kind of resurrected his memory in some ways. But he, he's the photographer, he's a life photographer that uh, did the loving story. And you can see him briefly in the movie about the loving story. Yeah. Yeah, he was just he he was he was the embodiment of the everyman photographer. He could make a picture of the used car salesman, the guy who just was working nine to five, or the the he, he was the everyman photographer. And I I didn't know him. If you could just give me a, a little bit about him, because you did know him. Well, you know the, the odd thing is I actually didn't know him at all. I mean, my only interaction with Gray was that three seconds at the desk at that day. I mean, here's a guy who changed my entire life. If he had not, if he had not looked at the pictures and then walked and then walked into John Lowengard's office, there'd be no day in life series. I probably would not be married to Jennifer. My daughter wouldn't be here at University of Wisconsin. I mean, so many people's lives were changed. Again, not because of me, but just because, you know, again, that faith journey thing of pushing you in one direction instead of the other. Um, but I mean, I remember that Gray was the photographer in the uh, in that movie, in the Loving movie, and uh, um, I'm glad you're going to interview Barbara. I, I spoke to her about two years ago, and we were doing uh, the uh, Good Fight book, yeah, because we actually featured that as one of the little uh, when you point your picture at the trailer uh, for Loving, uh, we show uh, guess who's coming to dinner and the Loving trailer and together, so you see sort of how people have looked at racism. And, uh, and and mixed race marriage over the years and how, again, how extraordinary, you know, that um, I think until 58, you could be arrested for marrying somebody of a different race, yeah. which, is, which is not that long ago, right? Unbelievable. No, I know. And, now 20, and by the way, 20% of all marriages in America today are, are uh, mixed race now. Yeah, I'm 20%. sure. 20%. That's sure. enormous. Yeah. So that kind of brings us full circle. You know, we started and, and you mentioned the fact that, and maybe that's another secret thing that photographers don't want to talk about, but they all, the reason photojournalists get into this is they really think they're going to change the world. And, um, and another friend of ours, Bill Pierce would say, you know, and the jokes yeah. on them because they do change the world. They change themselves and that's changing the world. And sometimes it's for the best. Sometimes it's, you know, for, makes them a little less good, but they are changing the world. And, and you've changed the world. Gray Villette changed the world. He changed your world without even knowing you. And so we are successful on that. And it's not a pipe dream to change the world as a photographer. And we do it every day. We just, we're not, uh, we're not, you know, uh, doing it that somebody in the Oval Office might recognize. Right. And then there's little changes and big changes. And there's changes that it's not till years later that you look back and you realize that what appeared to be just a moment of kindness changed the lives of hundreds of people, thousands mm -hmm. of people. I mean, I, I have no idea. I mean, I, you know, I, again, I'm not saying the day and life books were so particularly profound, but all the relationships that came out of those projects, there were so many, you know, after we started doing our sponsored books, you know, hundreds of other photographers said, oh, I did not realize I could do that. So everybody started going and finding, uh, you know, uh, companies and corporations and NGOs and, and people to make photo books possible. So mm -hmm. there's been the ripples that came out of that one little, you know, stone, which I'm sure Gray, you know, I don't know if Gray even knew, well, I'm sure he did know the impact he had. I, I did invite him to work on the first um, project, but he didn't, I don't remember why. I just, I remember, you know, of course I remember who he was obviously. Um, but, um, I don't know what he was, I think he went into more management or something at that point. Cause I remember he was like assistant director of photography, uh, under long at that point. So, so Rick, I'll let you go, but do you have, do you have one book to recommend? I like to, I like to recommend at least one book every episode. 
uh, a book of my own or a book of somebody else's it or could be, um, it could be anything. I mean, you know, the, the book, the only book I've really ever published of my own, uh, I actually published two books about Robin's camel trip, but one of them, uh, which is also interactive is called inside tracks. The first half of the book, I mean, it was actually kind of fun because um, I shot 150,000 pictures during Robin's camel trip and they used 30 pictures on the cover in national geographic, which, you know, 30 pictures is huge. But for me, it was like barely scratched the surface. So um, it was really fun to go back and go through my edit and then do a book where the pictures that I thought should have been published. Um, I'll, I'll give you two asides really quickly and then we'll finish up. One is that during her trip, uh, one day we were waiting for a plane to land to bring a uh, doctor because one of her camels had gotten hurt. And we were in an Aboriginal mission in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the desert. And it was a big red sort of dusty landing strip, just not paved at all. And there were a bunch of Aboriginal kids playing with a balloon and they were jumping. And then, you know, uh, and I shot this picture of the kids jumping and I thought it was the best picture I ever shot in my life. I knew at the moment as I snapped the shutter, I thought the kids had all jumped and the balloon was just in the right place. And then I looked at my camera and I realized I'd accidentally put Triax into the Kodachrome camera. And so uh, actually the opposite, I put Kodachrome in the Triax camera. So instead of the ASA being set at 25, it was set at 400. And so when the, when I, when the, the picture came out, it was this dark murky mess. And it was heartbreaking because it would have been an extraordinary picture. This is 1977. I put it in a safe deposit box thinking someday somebody may invent a technology to save the picture. Um, I went to Russell Brown at Adobe when we did the Inside Tracks book two years ago and uh, they scanned it and they restored it. And it's my favorite picture in the book. It's a double page spread. Um, and it's, Robin's not in the picture. It, you know, it, it's sort of tangentially related to the camel trip. Um, but I just love the way that the, that the, that just, I can't believe at the age of 27 or 28, whatever I was, that I had the wherewithal to save the slide. But I was just, wow. I, I looked at it and I just thought I was so crushed by my mistake. Um, so anyway, the, the Inside Tracks book, the first half of it are pictures, many of which were never published before for Robin's trip. And the second half is there was an extraordinary photographer who was on the set when they were making the movie Tracks. And the same synchronicity they actually created the sets from my photographs. It's the guys that did the King's Speech. So it's the same producers of the King's Speech did inside, did tracks. So, um, so the second half of the book are these amazing pictures uh, of, they're taken on the set. And they also let me go in and scan the actual frames from the movie itself, which is amazing. They shot in 35 millimeter, you know, Panavision film. So um, when you point at your camera, at my pictures of the first part of the book, it plays that scene in the movie on your iPhone, or your iPad. So the first book I'd recommend, uh, if people are curious, to see any of my own personal work is Inside Tracks, which is on Amazon. That, and the sounds, second that is, sounds amazing. Thank you. It's really fun. But the second one is, is the, the good fight. The good fight. Yeah, well, the good, food, good fight is because it, it's, it's um, you know, 150 photographers throughout history uh -huh. uh, looking at um, the, the history of social justice. And it's really inspiring. It's got wonderful essays and stories. And uh, it's everything from... Uh, you know, Elliot Erwitt's work to Gordon Parks. Um, just, uh, um, uh, who's the wonderful photographer at Kodak? Uh, sorry, at uh, Contact Now. Um, uh, um, she shot the picture. I'm sorry. I'm, young I'm, Geek? I'm totally embarrassed. Yeah, Young, young Geek Kim. Young yeah. Uh, her, her work is just extraordinary. It's the picture of the black men crying. Uh, is that a, that's Alpha a frame, frame, huh? That's a frame. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Every time I look at that, I just tear up. And it's just so powerful. It says everything. It says everything about the heartbreak and the pain and the the uh, the hatred and the racism that that we have um, as a nation are still dealing with and still um, in denial about. And the picture is just it's just an astounding photograph. Um, and there, and the whole book is the the nice thing about that book is all my other books, all the other books I've been fortunate to work on are are creating new photography but the good fight was actually having the the pleasure of going back through 100 years of archives and finding pictures some of which were very famous and some which no one's ever seen before uh, recounting this incredibly inspiring journey it's not a depressing book it sounds like it'd be depressing but it actually it's amazing how much we've advanced as a country over 100 years and it's amazing how much of that um progress is at risk right now thank you rick i just i can't I can't thank you enough for for sharing and um you know we're we're trying to we're trying to capture this this oral history 
of photojournalism and photography, journalism, all this stuff. And it's just, you've, you've lived such a major part of it. And thank you for just sharing that knowledge. Absolutely. I don't, do you ever put pictures into your podcast? I mean, do you add pictures, like you cut them in or is it, it's just a conversation? Uh, I do, but I do it like as we're talking. So if I would have had some pictures, I would have popped them up now. Got but it, got it, got it. I just, I just don't like to go into Premiere and start chopping after. That's kind of the workflow. Sure, sure. So I was going to la leave your listeners or, or viewers with one last thing to, to suggest. Um, I did a TED Talk a couple of years ago um, about a story we haven't discussed. But if, if your listeners are interested, it's like 1.4 million people have watched this TED Talk. It's about how photography can change two people's lives. It changed my lives and, and the life of a little girl that I was left I was left in a, I was left an 11 year old Amer Asian girl in a uh, dying woman's will in Korea. Also, when I was 29, right after Robin's camel trip, before the day in life books, and it's a story of her life, and it actually it's contemporary. So, if you go to uh, NatashaStory.com, no, so NatashaStory.com, um, it's the TED Talk, and it 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 shows the pictures, and it's um, it changed my entire life um, in a in a wonderful way, and and this little girl is now. My kids have sleepovers with her children, which is the part my brain still has trouble getting my head around. But um, it's the thing I'm probably the most proud of, much more proud than the day in life books. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, 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 it's my fault. I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about Natasha, and uh, I, I met her, and uh, I bet I met her back in '88. And it, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, she was at she the was Olympics. Kid. She, came, she was uh, working in the Kodak uh, uh, yeah. operation. The booth there. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun story to watch. Yeah. We'll, we'll link it's, to it's, that. Like 12, 12, it's 12 minutes on, on, you know, it's on the, it's on the Ted website. Yeah. I, 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 I meant to ask you and we got sidetracked. So, but thank no, it's you. Fine. It's, it's, yeah. you know. Thanks Rick. I sure appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much, Ken. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.